Okay, we're going to kick into the next session now. Malicious intruders, the insider threat, the mole. How do you defend yourself? How do you protect yourself against these threats? How do you even identify them and how do you deal with it? So to answer these questions, I'm going to introduce now Joseph Tam, who is an expert in this field. And he is from Resilient Security and Risk Consultant at Arup. Joseph. Thank you, Frank. Can you? Don't know if anyone can hear me yet. Yeah, probably yes. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm not sure if any of you were in the previous talk uh, with Red Bull Racing, but um, as I was there sitting and listening to them, it kind of reminded me just a couple of days ago how Elon Musk released uh, information about how his company came under attack by an insider threat, uh, where the insider sabotages operating system but also leaked uh, very sensitive information. So I hope this talk today is less philosophical, but more relevant to all of you in your organizations. So today I'll talk to you about uh, a brief overview of the threat environment that we're facing, um, but also breaking down what, inside, what different types of insiders there are, uh, finally looking into what critical assets your organization has, where they may be located, uh, and then translating that into a bit of reality by looking at a couple case studies that I myself worked with a few clients of ours, uh, and then some key takeaway messages for you all. So why are we talking about insider threats? Well, first of all, almost about a third of them that were recorded last year involved an insider. Um, secondly, it's less detectable than your other malicious risks. Um, on average, an insider can occur any time between six and five months of the, his or her employment. And lastly, and some ways more importantly, it's very financially costly as well to your organization. As this figure shows, that's just only one year for one, a couple of other sectors for intellectual property theft. Now, it's very important to not lump insiders all in one. Uh, here, I've kind of broken them down into four sort of typical user groups. Um, I won't read them all out in terms of what sort of knowledge they have and the level of knowledge they have about your organization, but you can see there's a downward trend in terms of how much knowledge they have about your typical organization, uh, from your employees to your former employees to your subcontractors and subconsultants, and then your building management and facilities management type of staff. But what's important to know, and which we'll dive in a little bit more into detail, is you notice at the bottom um, what seemingly is of a lower end of level of inside knowledge. In fact, this group is quite important. So not only do they differ in terms of level of inside knowledge, but they also differ in terms of type of knowledge. So on your left here, you see there's, they really pertain to intellectual property, and then on the right, those user groups really know more about your building operations and building management systems. It's important to know that intellectual property, although a lot of us talk about intellectual property when we come to insiders, it's easy to lump it all together. Uh, it's more important to break it out. And I, I'd like to draw your attention particularly to customer or client data, uh, which increasingly in this day and age where technology uh, is so rampant everywhere, that's a very important part of our business as well. Um, but most importantly is, although a lot of the eyes and focus is on IP and the theft of it or the leakage of it, a lot of the infrastructure increasingly because of the IP, how it's digitized and stored and accessed and maintained a lot of the, on the infrastructure networks, um, the inside knowledge that the groups on the right possess is very important to protecting that IP. So I don't make this stuff up. We ourselves have collected some of this data ourselves, um, looking at all the historical incidents over the last decade across different sectors and globally as well. Now you notice that although IP constantly is on the forefront of media and a lot of people's minds, it actually is only about a third of the incidents that we've recorded. In fact, closely, more importantly, we say that manipulative sabotage of IT systems and engineering systems are equally important. And the reason for that is because, like I said before, a lot of the information 
the, a lot of the intellectual property is being increasingly stored and accessed and maintained on your data centers, on IT systems and networks, which is then powered and supported by critical uh, infrastructure with power um, and utilities. But what's important to, you can see from this page is that there are many different types of insiders. They range from scientists to technicians to former employees. And then they'll target very different types of assets within an organization. Engineering systems, leakage of IP, um, and so forth. So you may ask, it's quite good to know and talk about critical assets. It's kind of a buzzword. But where exactly are your critical assets within an organization, particularly in the context of a building? So for ease of understanding, I've broken them down into three categories. Um, on your left really pertains more to what is more known as data center networks. Some of your organizations may not be that big to have your own data center. So you might move to co-located or maybe just main server rooms. But a lot of the integral parts of that data center network is comprised of smaller parts, network routers, switches, risers, all that fascinating stuff. But then in the middle you have the building control systems which support the ongoing 24-7 of IT connectivity that we all rely and depend upon for our work, for our sales, for our business. Any sabotage to any of those power, electricity, water, cooling, air temperature, all those are very important. And lastly, your sensitive workplaces, depending on the sector that you're in, your research labs and places of R&D, product development are obviously most important, but then don't forget about the archives and the libraries as some organizations are only starting to move into the digital age and starting to move from hard copy to soft copy. So we'll try to understand a little bit more in the context of case study. Um, here's the first one where I've worked with a civil aviation regulator where we looked across the whole country of 26 different air navigation facilities. Now, of course, it's a very important business that they're in. And as such, we looked at all the sites. But what importantly we helped them realize is, for example, there's a couple where they didn't know where the critical assets were. So the first example you see here is the air traffic control center. Very important asset, of course. Um, but they didn't realize that if in the event that this control center failed over, the Aviation Academy, where they train their students and the future talent, is a, an importantly critical asset as well. The reason so in this case is because they had the simulators, which had the same technology, same level of detail, and the track staff are trained to the same level of standard, which could provide the same level of redundancy in the event the control center failed over. Next example is obviously everybody knows control towers are very important. Um, what they did here is they put the backup cabins as a redundancy to these control towers in a very front of house space in the passenger terminals, which anyone could access. Now they, the argument is that only an insider would know the location of this, um, but we pointed out that insider threat is a very feasible and credible risk to us all nowadays. And lastly, the fault maintenance center, which doesn't sound very exciting, but actually is very critical to them because this was one centralized location where all the engineering errors and reports were dealt and addressed to. And they thought they had a good handle of it because they subcontracted to one single subcontractor. But what they failed to realize is this subcontractor then outsourced it to money others. Our second case study is one where we helped our technology firm build and consolidate all the businesses into one business park. And obviously it's a great thing and a lot of tech firms are doing that nowadays as you see in the San Francisco Bay Area and so forth. Um, and as by virtue of that though, we kind of helped them identify that as a vulnerability because they had so many different business functions. Also they had one shared basement underneath them which would circumvent any security measures they had up top. Also, this basement had mixed vehicle access. They had mixed shared parking of staff, visitors, contractors, deliveries, all mixed all together. And then lastly, they had all the sensitive warehouses, waste rooms, IT storage rooms, all in the basement, which consisted the same IP 
as the research labs that they had up top in the building. Now what we did was we helped them assess those and inform the design mitigations that we put in. So one example was appropriate access rights according to each building and different user group and business function, but not only per building, but also within the building, sensitive spaces as well. Screening of people leaving, not entering, is quite an interesting one, which many of you may not have heard of, but the concern here is, is insider threat and leakage of data, so they, they're not too concerned about people coming in and stealing th uh, things, but more about their own staff or contractors or subconsultants leaving the building with IP. And then lift controls at basements so that no circumvention of the security, and then vehicle control measures to segregate all the different groups. And then lastly, the protection of the critical assets we told them in the basement had to have the same level of protection as the ones above. Now lastly, our case, case study here is one, of, uh, one we're still sort of working on but uh, coming to a close, which is a biomedical research facility. Now in the context of this case, all eyes, all the client's attention, all the media's attention is towards the shiny new research facility that they're building. But actually through our work, what we helped them realize is adjacent to this research facility was one single critical asset building, which you can imagine if you put some creativity to it, which is the black and blue sort of power plant looking building, which provided all the power and electricity, all to IT needs. It even included the data center as well to support the research business that they had. Now what's important as we go by is that this power plant building became the single point of failure for all the clean air that the research needed and, all, and the clean water that the research needed and all the 24-7 power and electricity that the research needed as well. It also hosted the data center um, for all the science applications that they had. So all the scientists had to access this data center 24-7 for the research and the database. Um, it also held external third-party data, which kind of in some ways exposes them to a whole host of different types of risks as well. But lastly, just the data center itself, because it's providing basic connectivity to the IT needs, uh, this became a real important critical asset for the business. And lastly, I pointed out IT and storage build rooms because it's actually an area for this case where all the data center equipment, all the IT equipment, all the laptops, mobile devices, which could contain IP uh, is stored uh, in this power plant building, which is deemed probably less vulnerable and particularly very attractive anyways to an insider. So if, I hope if you're gonna take anything away from today is at least these three points. Um, one is that try not to lump all the insiders together. The importance of breaking them down into different user groups is because you want to understand that they possess different levels of knowledge, which means that they could potentially do different types of harms and to different types of critical assets of your business. Secondly is try to learn more about your business and your organization, but particularly to know more where and what your critical assets are. The reason why? Because insiders are going to target those more likely than other parts of your business. And lastly, try to steer a little bit away, not to completely forget, but IP is always the, going to be the focus of insider threats, risks and mitigation measures. But try to think also about physical sabotage and the potential impact it could do to your business because as we saw with some of the case studies and examples, it's very disruptive to your organization and more importantly in some ways very costly as well. Thank you very much. If there's any questions or no, or no. If I can ask the first question here. Thanks very much for that, Joseph. Um, I don't know if you were here in the earlier session, but we, we talked a little bit about insider threat there and I mentioned there's something called DVing, developed vetting, which is what the intelligence and security agencies use in the UK, they use an outside company that goes into somebody's background. Anybody who's going to work in a sensitive position in counter-terrorism or intelligence gets vetted very yeah. extensively. And, you know, if they're going to be joining MI5, for example, you know, it can take months to clear them. Why, 
well, obviously you need to make sure that they're not up to no good, but also, um, traditionally, it's been to protect them and the company or the employers from blackmail. You don't want a situation where somebody joins a company, they have access to very sensitive information, and somebody who wants that information has got something on them and says, right, listen, you really don't want these photographs that were taken 12 years ago to get out, do you? So do the decent thing and hand over the, the, you know, the source key, key codes or whatever. Mm. To how far back does a company, a big company, with sensitive IP issues, how far back do they go when they're vetting somebody? Do they just look at what they've been doing in the last year, what their, what their resume, their CV says, or do they hire outside companies to actually really delve deep? Yeah, so, for example, um, if I go back to this, um, this client of ours, it's a pharmaceutical client, and they do the same level of vetting very seriously for the subcontractors and consultants. Um, they actually take different grades and levels of vetting. So to answer your point is, depending on what you're appointed or brought on to do, uh, if you're only going to access certain parts of the building or certain parts of the business, um, they will uh, give you different types of access rights. But then as part of that, dive into lengths of background and experience, but also social media and, and so forth. Um, in fact, as, as part of what I do as a security consultant for our clients, uh, we work on very critical national infrastructure projects to do with rail, airports, and nuclear sites. And in fact, in, in, our, own build, in our own company, we have a level of screening that we undertake as well um, to fulfill those government requirements. So, yeah. So. Any, any questions from the audience? Yes, chill on the back there. You're going to have to repeat it. If you hold the thing at power the ground, yeah? okay. that's it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just a, a graduate student and uh, going to cyber security. What kind of skill would you say one need in order to, to go into it? I don't know. Of, of course, you were talking about uh, the information part of it. Now, are there any techno skills that one would need? For, for cyber security? Yeah, so in terms of um, you're saying um, uh, being able to, to see the threats, uh, are there any physical thing that one can be able to tell that somebody's doing it within the company, for example? So, so if I understand correctly, your question is what sort of skills does one or should one have if they're going to go into cyber security and protecting critical assets from that perspective? Is that, yeah? So, my knowledge around cybersecurity is not so technical. Um, so, obviously, most of what I spoke about today is revolving around how you protect those critical assets uh, from an insider physically at there. But as we saw with some of the, the examples previously, where you could have an insider um, not having to be off site or more importantly, they prefer to be on site and sabotaging or manipulating some of the IT systems through a malicious code or malicious hardware device to very sensitive and important critical assets. Um, I would say that that's one area that a lot of focus should be more on. Um, there's obviously a lot of talk about people hacking off site or penetrating firewalls or security systems through through the internet. Um, but one that's constantly overlooked is internally, someone could easily do the damage by being inside, in some ways even more damage because they're being on site as well. Uh, Any more questions? Um, just can I ask, which is the which is the most common threat? Is it is it physical? Most common inside the threat? Is it IP? Is it physical? Is it IT? It's it's hard to say. I mean, I mean, you could look. Uh, I mean, as you can all see, this sort of graph is 
just a snapshot of last decade and, and our own proprietary data that we collected. But, but uh, you've, you've but merged IT with engineering systems then? Yes, yeah, and the, the reason why is because the method of attack is sabotage uh, rather, than, rather than anything else. Um, but if, I don't know how many of you knew about the Tesla incident that literally occurred two days ago. Um, the insider did basically both. Um, he had knowledge about the operating, uh, manufacturing operating system that they had. Obviously, Tesla is a very tech-savvy and tech-heavy company. Um, so, in some ways, I mean, I, c I can only assume that it was a malicious code that was inputted and sabotaged the manufacturing process and delayed that manufacturing line. But at the same time, if you read into that news a bit more, what the insider also did was export huge amounts of data, sensitive database that Tesla had about the, the products and services and the staff uh, all to outsiders. So it's both sabotage of, of systems but also s leakage or theft of IP as well. So you, you have a pie chart here showing the breakdown of, of what's been damaged. Is there a similar pie chart breakdown of the motive? In other words, what motivates? Is it is it anarchic, just troublemaking? Is it commercial greed? Yeah. Or is it just sort of sabotage, malicious? How do you break it down? Yeah, so actually for, for, this, um, for this client of ours, which was a technology conglomerate, they actually asked us, in addition to this piece of work, benchmark them in terms of commercial espionage, how they sit against the competitors and how vulnerable they are. Uh, to somebody coming from outside, maybe social engineering their way into the organization. Um, it's, it's definitely, that's definitely one motivation for someone committing insider threats. But actually, like Elon Musk said a couple of days ago, more of the reasons that he believes in is actually more driven personally. Maybe it's to do, for the case of Tesla, it was because he didn't get promoted. That was simply that. Um, rather than financial greed or for anything else. Uh, sometimes it could be very personally driven, which is why uh, vetting of the staff can be increasingly difficult for this type of risk. Um, and, and so the focus really I want to try to get to you all is try maybe not to focus more on detecting and determining the likelihood of it happening to you, but more about protecting and minimizing the vulnerability of your organization and minimizing the impact when it does happen. Is there a difference in penalties between what the US and UK law would do for an insider aspect? Obviously, it depends on what they steal or what they do. But is the US tougher than the UK on this? Uh, I, I honestly can't say, really. Um, I don't know enough about <laughs> the law aspect of that. Um, I would say it's not too different, maybe. I, I don't know if anyone else in the audience knows uh, much about the penalty for this type of theft. Okay, any, any further questions to Joseph on the insider threat, to, uh, particularly to critical assets, protecting your critical assets? Because what I'm hoping is that people will go back to your companies and pass on the stuff that you're hearing um, at this. And Joseph, do you have a stand here? Has Arab got a stand? No, we don't, no. But I'm, I'm around for the rest of the day. Actually, I see some of my colleagues here as well. So, I mean, feel free to come to us or my email address is up here. So if you want to ask any questions, feel free as well. Okay. Uh, Joseph Tan from Arab, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. So the next session is, we've got a little bit of a break, short break. Next session is at 1.20 p.m. on behavioral detection and analytics. Behavioral detection and analytics, half-hour session at 1.20. So I hope to see you here then.